the Holy Spirit is a lot more impersonal to people than the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son, we look in Scripture, we see them speaking through words, we see them acting through deeds, but the Spirit's a little bit different. There's a lot of people when they take Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 and Jesus came down or the Spirit came down in the form of a dove and that's kind of the way that they see the Spirit. They see Him as someone who's light and fluffy. But we're going to look in the lesson in particular in five passages and we're going to see what we can do to the Holy Spirit. And I think as far as, as far as I was concerned, when I started looking at this and piecing this together, it was pretty remarkable what we can do to the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, it's really good for us to know how we actually need to treat Him as one of the Godhead. So I hope you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and we'll get started in our study. And I'll take the chance to thank everyone for the opportunity just to be able to speak and especially for all the people who are listening now and who will listen in the future. I really do hope that the lesson will give you something to think about and certainly will not only build you up but hopefully make you even stronger in Jesus Christ because that's what our intention is. That's what the purpose of everything is that we do, that Danny does, that we participate in in this work. We want to exalt the Lord, and we want to leave better than we were before. So what can we do to the Holy Spirit? Ephesians chapter 4, let's look all the way down in the 30th verse, almost to the end of the chapter. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What can I do? I can grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit is a very serious offense. You may not have known this, there's only two occasions in the Old Testament where the two words Holy Spirit are put together. I'll take you to one of them. Isaiah chapter 63, let's look in the uh, 10th verse. Isaiah chapter 63, looking in the 10th verse. So as we're turning to Isaiah chapter 63, we're getting on down into the book where it's looking forward to, it's putting out that, that wonderful view of what the kingdom is going to be. So Isaiah chapter 63 verse 10, But they rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit, so He turned Himself against them as an enemy, and He fought against them. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? Isaiah 63 verse 10 gives me a pretty decent indication because it puts together the concept of grieving with what? Rebelling. Rebelling. Israel's rebellion against the Spirit led Moses to curse the people by instead of speaking to the rock, striking it. So that was incorrect for Moses to do, of course. And because that was incorrect for Moses to do, he violated what the Spirit had said, therefore grieving the Spirit. The, the concept's exactly the same. Now when we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, let me let you look. In the context, Ephesians chapter 4, so if you look all the way back in verse 17, and I'm not going to have the opportunity to read this, but just look. Ephesians 4, 17. No longer you walk like the rest of the Gentiles walk. Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance, because of the they've given themselves over to lewdness. They work all uncleanliness, uncleanness with greediness. But you've not learned Christ. If you've heard and you've been taught by the truth in Jesus Christ, now 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of the mind. Put on the new man, created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So, put away, verse 25, lying. In 26, be angry and do not sin. 27, don't give place to the devil. 28, let him who still who stole still no longer, but let him labor. 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and necessary edification, that it can impart grace to the hearers. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Guys, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? It means that when I've got actions on how to act, when I go opposite of that, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit, and so are you as well. It's a serious offense, and one that I don't need to take. When Scripture says that this is the pattern of righteousness, and I have to live up to that pattern, I can't disrespect it at all. What can I do to the Holy Spirit? Let's go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 15. Because in Acts chapter 7 verse 51 it's telling me that I can resist him. So Acts chapter 7 verse 51, this is Stephen making a very bold, a very impassioned plea to the Jews of that day. Before we read this, according to Calvinism, you can't resist the Holy Spirit. That's why one of the tenets of Calvinism is irresistible grace. The Holy Spirit comes to the elect, and when the Holy Spirit comes to the elect, as, as many Baptists, particularly primitive Baptists, believe, when the Holy Spirit comes on that person, you don't resist it. And so therefore, you're going to be saved, and once you're saved by an irresistible power of the Spirit, you're going to stay saved. That's what they believe, and that's what they teach. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, and so do you. Now the word resisting means more than just ignoring it. The word resist in Acts 7 verse 51 means to fall against or to fall on something. They were striving against it. They weren't just indifferent to the gospel. They were fighting against it. And we've met a lot of people who are indifferent to the gospel, but we also meet people who actively fight against it. That's resisting the Spirit. And that's exactly what I can do. Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is actually giving us a, a good look. I mean, Stephen said that you resist, but let's kind of dive just a little bit deeper into that. Matthew chapter 23, now starting in verse 34. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and you'll persecute from city to city. That on you may come all of the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. The problem with these people was not a lack of knowledge. It was a lack of will. Remember John chapter 7, verse 17, if anyone is willing to do the will of the Father, they can. Brethren, they didn't have the will. And so someone who rejects and someone who opposes the gospel is someone who is resisting the Holy Spirit, not a sin to be taken lightly. Third, when I go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the 19th verse, I'm going to find that I can quench the Spirit. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the 19th verse comes at a section in the Thessalonian letter where Paul is just giving a lot of very short exhortations in rapid fire. So it's just very simply stated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. So quenching is to cause fervent activity to cease. So fervency and zealousness in Scripture is often kind of denoted by a, by a fire, the concept of fire. So what do I do as I quench a fire, I pour water on it, and it just ceases that activity? So this is basically what quenching the Spirit is. Every single person has a decision to make. They've got to decide whether or not they're going to serve Christ or they're going to serve the devil. I mean, everyone's got that choice. Let me show you in a couple of places. In Ephesians chapter 6, let's look in verse 16. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, said within the context of us putting on the full armor of God is this statement. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. Quench them. Put them out. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. 
Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus speaks, this isn't really using the concept of quenching, but it is most definitely using the concept of making a decision. Matthew 12, verse 30, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You can't keep two fires burning at the same time. I know it's physically possible, but it's not spiritually possible. If I light one, it quenches the other, and vice versa. And that's not me, that's not me making the rule, that's just Jesus Christ making the rule. You quench one, the other one's going to burn the brighter. Everyone's got the choice as to which one they're going to feed, and then therefore which one they're going to quench. So you know what your choice going to be because that's really what it comes down to. And I can see the choice actually working in my life in a particular way. John chapter 8 verse 31 for instance. John chapter 8 verse 31 and we can illustrate this in just a handful of ways so we'll take the time to do it. In John chapter 8 let's look in verse 31. So John 8 verse 31 a lot of people make a lot of verse 32 because verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's almost proverbial in its nature. So we remember it. I actually want us to look in 31 because 31 to me hits harder than 32 at this very moment. John 8, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. You're going to stoke the fire of the Word having an active interplay in your life. That's what it means. If, for example, I go a little bit further, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul gave what becomes essentially a guiding principle for us as it relates to Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, and there's a lot of people in the religious world who have no off switch. Authoritatively speaking, there is no off switch. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, though, look at the principle. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to transfer to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think what is, beyond, what is beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf one against the other. So there's the principle. Not to think beyond what is written. So I've got it written, and I can't what? I can't think, or I can't go beyond that. Paul said it similarly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, that we study or that we're diligent to present ourselves approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the Word of God. You, you probably understand the background of handling accurately. Danny's probably brought it up before, but it's such a neat way of thinking about it. I will do it again. Paul was a tent maker. Handling accurately was a word that came in the original language from kind of a secular background. That secular background was material that was cut in a straight line. So here was Paul as a tent maker using an application by saying, you need to learn how to cut that word accurately. Learn what it really means because if you don't, then what you're going to ultimately end up doing is you're going to quench the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, If anyone speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles. Another, another word, a more picturesque word. For the revelation of God, that's what I have to speak. As I speak that, I respect the Word. As I live up to that Word, I'm not going to quench it. It remains a fervent, active part of my life. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Looking in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, 
we see the principle that we go to a lot. So let's kind of jump backwards just a little bit to verse 24. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, now the, the sinning willfully in the context is chapter 25, these people were leaving Christ. They had been converted out of Judaism apparently. Now they were making the decision to go back. That was the forsaking of the assembling in verse 25. And we, we see it a lot, Danny. You know, you start to see people waffling. And that everyone's different, but people falling away tends to take a pretty remarkably similar pattern. And part of what we see is that beginning of waffling of their devotion to Jesus Christ. Now, how is that best measured? It's not the only measure, but the best way that I can tell your devotion to Jesus Christ is being here. That's number one. And when I start to see that go away, you're starting to leave Jesus Christ. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's the way it's always been. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. I know the pattern. If we go on sinning willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. So the Holy Spirit in, in this passage, and I think it's actually very, very beautiful. In this passage, the Holy Spirit becomes a mechanism to deliver the grace of God. Isn't that neat to think about? He's become a mechanism to deliver the grace of God. You see this in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. This is certainly not an unknown concept in Scripture. Acts chapter 20, look in the 32nd verse. Acts chapter 20, looking in the 32nd verse, Paul is kind of rounding out his discussion to the elders. He says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What does the Spirit do? He reveals the word. And what is it? Among other things, it's a word of grace. A word of grace. If I walk away from it, I'm insulting the spirit of grace. Madeline Murray O'Hare, the American atheist who was responsible for ending public prayer and public Bible reading in school in 1964, used to call the Holy Spirit the spook used to call the Holy Spirit the spook if I understand scripture now she knows better and now will anyone know better who has ever insulted the spirit of grace the spirit is there brethren to accomplish a task and it's a very very important one, a monumental task. We don't have the right to just turn and insult that. We don't want to pay those consequences. Let me let you look at one more. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Let's look in verses 31 and 32 because the last item that we have, at least in the New Testament, of what can be done to the Holy Spirit is blaspheming Him. Now, for a lot of people, this one's a little bit more mysterious, but I think when you look in the context, you can, you can piece together exactly what's going on. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, I, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. 
Now, who's a great example of someone who blasphemed but yet was forgiven? Paul was. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. I don't even have to piece it together. I don't even have to define the, word, define the words Paul said. I blasphemed. But I received mercy. So why does Jesus say something that, you know, admittedly a lot of people, and, and it's probably in very, probably done with a good heart, but people think it's just very, unknowable, very mysterious. Well, when you look in the context, Matthew chapter 12, 31 and 32, you were dealing with the Pharisees, or Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees, and he was teaching, or we know about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were opposing Jesus at every step of the way. In fact, there's only a couple of examples that we see of Pharisees who essentially were giving Jesus a break. One of them was Nicodemus, and we can ascertain that Nicodemus was a believer in Jesus Christ and certainly was amenable to his teaching, but that's about as far as we can go. Paul was the other one, and he just said in 1 Timothy chapter 13, he had blasphemed, but he had received mercy. But by and large, the Pharisees were people who just cut off the words of Jesus. They didn't let them permeate. They didn't accept them. So what did that mean? Well, effectively, as Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all working in tandem with one another as He is going through His work on the earth, if you resist His words, you're resisting the Father's words. In fact, the Gospel of John made a very clear communication between the two of them. You believe in Me, you believe in the Father. You believe in the Father, you believe in Me. But the Spirit's right there too. And if you reject what Jesus is saying, you're rejecting what the Spirit is saying. And you blaspheme Him. You speak against Him. Now we can even go a step further. Let's go to John chapter 16. And let's go to verse 8. Because we want to see just why was Jesus so final about all of this. That's a great question and it's one that can be most definitely answered. John chapter 16 verse 8. When He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is after I leave. So after I leave, here comes the Spirit. And the Spirit, through the writing of the apostles, is going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Convicting doesn't necessarily mean something negative. It can just mean something that's convincing, just fairly neutral, honestly. So what's he going to do? He's going to convince about sin and righteousness and judgment. Well, then who's going to come? That's the catch. No one else is going to come. So if you reject the Father in the Old Testament as, a, as He's speaking to the, the fathers and He's speaking to the prophets and then His Son comes and you reject Him and then the Spirit comes and you reject Him, you're out of options. If that state stays permanent, then you go back to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Why not? Because there's no other option left. There's no other option left. You give up on the Holy Spirit, you've given up on everything that there is that's going to try to convince you of where you are. There wasn't going to be another one. You give up on Him, you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. You walk away from the, the teaching of the Holy Spirit, there's not something else left that came between that time and this time that can convince you. That's why it's unforgivable. Just no other options remaining. So brethren, this is what we can do to the Holy Spirit. We can grieve Him, we can resist Him, we can quench Him, we can insult Him, and we can blaspheme Him. And this has really, this has been a lesson where we've actually gotten to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, but really, don't miss the point. The point is, the Holy Spirit's communicating something to us. And you're getting it. You're reading it at home. You're having it preached to you and taught to you. 
on the first day of the week. You're having it taught through Zoom on Sundays as well and on Wednesdays. So you're having all of these options where the Holy Spirit is open to you. If you turn away from it, you're grieving Him, you're insulting Him, you're blaspheming Him. You're not letting Him give you the tools to change your life and make it more applicable to Jesus Christ. And that's the problem. And that's what we want to remove today. We want people to get rid of the rebellion that they have. Remember, that was the first item. Back into grieving the Holy Spirit. We want to get rid of that rebellion. We want to get people back to actually following the Scriptures, to actually following what the Word of God says, and actually following what we need to do to be saved. And we're going to give you that chance, people who have a necessity to come to Jesus Christ today can do it through their confession of faith. They can do it through their repentance of sins. They can do it through their submitting to baptism, which washes away those sins. One of those sins is the constant sin of rebellion. Maybe that's been the sin of somebody today in the audience. And that can be alleviated, not by us, mind you, but by you turning your heart back to God. We're only the, I used the word earlier, we're only the vehicles for that. And that's what we can do, and that's what we'll encourage you to do. And we've selected this song for that time. So if there's someone that needs to come up and make that known to us, let's do that while we'll stand and sing.